Clear communication is the key to understanding, but there is an old adage that there are two sides to every story. So what happens when written history and collective memory favor just one side? Throughout American history, there is a repeated pattern of inaccurate or incomplete communication of the Native American experience. Miscommunication of the Native American perspective has resulted in systemic misunderstanding, with far-reaching consequences. For most Americans, the Pilgrim's experience at Plymouth is synonymous with the story of the first Thanksgiving. But the Thanksgiving narrative most Americans are familiar with minimizes the perspective and proactive role of the Wampanoag people. With his tribe weakened from disease and seeing that the pilgrims intended to stay, Chief Massasoit sought an alliance with the separatists for defense against other area tribes. The now famous Thanksgiving feast occurred not because the tribe was extended a dinner party invitation, as many believe, but because the Wampanoag heard gunshots coming from the pilgrim settlement. Honoring their agreement and assuming their allies were in danger, the Wampanoag hurried to help. At the settlement, they discovered that the gunfire was purely celebratory, and they joined in the harvest festivities. The first written account occurred when Edward Winslow, he was a Mayflower passenger, and he wrote a private letter to a friend in England. He says, our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling so that we might, after a more special manner, rejoice together. The fragmentary record of this event permitted Americans' imagination to fill in the details. The 1621 harvest feast wasn't dubbed the first Thanksgiving until 1840, 220 years after the fact. Sarah Joseph Hale, a Mayflower descendant and journalist, starts telling stories about Thanksgiving and she wants it to become a sort of nationwide um, holiday. And it's at a time in our history when these early generations of Americans were saying, we need to tell stories about who we are. This is what it means to be American. After Hale lobbied five presidents, Thanksgiving finally became an official holiday under Abraham Lincoln. It's really designed to create this holiday that rejoins the country together in the middle of the Civil War. While these early retellings do not appear to have been malicious in their omissions, their incomplete portrayals nonetheless robbed the Wampanoag and later Americans from a complete understanding of the tribe's loyalty as an ally. As a nation, we've forgotten in our storytelling or chosen not to tell the stories of indigenous people. This pattern of miscommunicating events involving Native Americans continued. Andrew Jackson deliberately misrepresented Native Americans and their experience in order to further his political agenda, ultimately legalizing the acquisition of Native American lands and normalizing racism towards Native people. In Jackson's first inaugural address in 1829, he stated his intention to observe toward the Indian tribes that humane and considerate attention to their rights, which is consistent with the habits of our government. Yet these statements contradict his actions. Just 14 months later, after pressuring Congress, President Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. This legislation authorized the president to purchase Native Americans' desirable, cultivated land located within state's boundaries and to grant them unsettled federal land west of the Mississippi instead. Jackson illegally threatened, bribed, and coerced tribes into signing removal treaties. The law required that they negotiate, but Andrew Jackson ignored that part of the law, and the Cherokee, for example, were removed forcibly. By 1837, Jackson's government succeeded in relocating 50,000 Native Americans, and at least 25 million acres of rich land became available to white settlers. 16,000 Cherokees were forced to walk the 1,200 miles, later known as the Trail of Tears, to Indian Territory. Despite 4,000 Cherokees dying due to assault, murder, weather, disease, and hunger, Jackson misrepresented these events, proclaiming, It gives me pleasure to announce to Congress that the benevolent policy of the government in relation to the removal of the Indians beyond the white settlements is approaching to a happy consummation. Recognizing that removal of the Native Americans would incalculably strengthen the southwestern frontier, prime cotton land, and would enable those states to advance rapidly in population, wealth, and power, Jackson disseminated the idea that Native Americans were savages with neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement, which are essential to any favorable change in their condition. They must necessarily bear long disappearance. They framed it as a win-win for everybody. Jackson's miscommunication of the process of Indian removal and the racist rhetoric he used to defend his policies had a lasting impact on the attitudes and behavior of westward migrants in the succeeding decades. As settlers rapidly moved west, calling it their manifest destiny in 1845, they eagerly applied the view Jackson had promoted of Native Americans as an expendable, inferior race 
in order to justify their takeover of native lands, as demonstrated by a government report in 1852. Destiny had awarded California to the Americans to develop, and if the Indians interfered with progress, they should be pushed aside. Settlers continued the pattern of miscommunicating about Native Americans for their own gain. Written records of the Bear River Massacre likewise favored a biased telling of events and omitted the Native American perspective. It's the largest massacre of Native Americans in the history of the United States that nobody knows about. In 1862, Colonel Patrick Connor and his Union troops, stationed at Fort Douglas in the Utah Territory, had the duty to protect the mail route from Native American attack and to keep an eye on Mormon settlers, whom mainstream Americans distrusted. Connor was known to be itching for a fight. They wanted the glory of fighting in the Civil War, and instead they get posted in Utah. Limited natural resources had led to pressure between Mormon settlers and local natives. Colonel Connor took complaints from the settlers as an excuse to initiate armed conflict. He led his men toward the Shoshone encampment and arrived near Dawn on January 29, 1863. They attacked the whole village, women, children, elderly, warriors. Everyone. The Shoshone took up arms in self-defense. But the Native Americans quickly ran out of ammunition and the troops just kept firing. After about four hours, uh, more than 400 Shoshone were massacred. Colonel Connor and his men returned with reports of their heroism, prompting Connor's promotion to Brigadier General. Journalists, over 100 miles away from the site, had no opportunity to investigate the Shoshone side of the story. A Salt Lake paper published, from every statement that we have heard from those who were in the field, we conclude that the volunteers must have met the Indians with a bravery seldom equaled by regulars. An incomplete account of the event persisted for the next 150 years. The 1930 and 1986 memorials to Colonel Connor, the 1932 plaque celebrating the militiamen, and its 1953 edition recognizing the pioneer women who tended to the wounded all failed to communicate the Shoshone perspective. It was called the Battle of Bear River, even though the army attacks a sleeping village. The Shoshone who survived the attack communicated the details of their experience to their children. May Timbimbu Perry's grandfather survived the massacre by playing dead. She spent years lobbying to correct the historical record. Finally, the National Park Service changed the name from the Battle of Bear River to the Bear River Massacre. Just recently, a new plaque on the Bear River Massacre Memorial was unveiled, finally illuminating the Native American side of the story. This is where tribal people have actually been working proactively, pushing to change, the, to make the interpretation inclusive, to tell the whole story. The reporting of the final armed engagement between the U.S. government and Native Americans in 1890 repeated many of the same elements of miscommunication apparent in the massacre at Bear River. The Lakota tribe was forced to hunt on 20% of their original reservation, with buffalo herds depleted by settlers. With promised food rations cut by Congress the year before, and suffering harsh winter and drought conditions, they were starving. When news spread of a vision by a Paiute prophet that if the Plains Indians would peacefully perform the ritual ghost dance, then the white invaders would disappear and We could reclaim our ways of life, the buffalo would come back, and we would be reunited with our lost loved ones. The Lakota embraced the ghost dance religious movement. Concerned that the ghost dancers were actually preparing for war, U.S. officials decided to take some of the chiefs into custody and disarm and relocate the troublemakers. The largest deployment of federal troops since the Civil War was dispatched to end the ghost dance movement. When Colonel James Forsyth and the 7th Cavalry reached the Lakota camp near Wounded Knee Creek, Chief Bigfoot offered to surrender without resistance. On December 29th, the military surrounded the tribe's encampment and began to confiscate the tribe's weapons. When a deaf man misunderstood and didn't give up his gun, he was strong-armed by soldiers and his weapon went off. So when there was one gunshot, everybody started shooting. With most of their weapons confiscated, the Lakota were slaughtered. Worse, the soldiers targeted teepees of women and children, and those who fled were hunted for miles and murdered. 300 Lakota were massacred, half of which were women and children. Many of the 25 U.S. soldiers who died were actually killed by friendly fire. Initially presented as a battle, local settlers were relieved that the presumed uprising had been stopped. 20 Congressional Medals of Honor were awarded to the soldiers, and Colonel Forsyth was promoted to Major General. At the site, there's a big sign up there, and it used to say, Wounded Knee Battlefield. But surviving eyewitnesses worked to correct the record. In 1912, some newspapers began calling the battle a massacre, but it wasn't until the 1990s that a memorial to the Lakota was included at the National Historic Landmark. Trying to understand history knowing only one side of the story is like trying to see with one eye closed, no depth perception. Communication of the Native American perspective is vital for real understanding of the people and history of the United States.